I want to welcome everybody here this morning, and uh, it's great to see the sunshine out again, in spite of the forecast, and uh, I want to welcome you all here. I was just thinking this morning that, uh, you know, this past week I've been, Henry will get this, uh, um, he did, used to do plumbing, but uh, with plumbing, um, sometimes you get a valve that's just old and it won't open properly. What's interesting about bad valves, it doesn't matter how bad it is, there's lots of water behind there. In fact, if you live in Calgary, um, you have all of that Bow River coming through the city waterworks and you have like limitless amounts of water. And that Bow River is supplied by glaciers in the mountain and that God keeps adding to every year in his faithfulness. So when you have a valve that works like a fire hydrant, it can just pour out. And sometimes I think our God's love is something like that. The Bible tells us that God's love is unending, that it's never failing that it's more than we can think or even imagine. And yet, for many of us, I'm going to guess there are times where you just don't feel his love. And I think sometimes the valves in our own selves get a little clogged up. So they're just not letting it flow as well. The Bible says in Isaiah 30, verse 18, Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. And therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. For a people shall dwell in Zion, in Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will surely be gracious for you at the sound of your cry. As soon as he hears it, he answers you. And you get this picture that God has so much love just waiting for us. And he's just waiting for us to get that valve a little bit unclogged. And just kind of, in fact, we don't even have to unclog it. We just have to have him for his help to unclog it. And then in expectancy, look to him and his love will begin to flow again. So I want you to know this morning that God loves you. And he's got so much more for you. So let's begin by worshiping together as Haram leads us. There is nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your our living home your presence Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free when my shame is undone, your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, our long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us 
just become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the welcome God's presence among us this morning. Just a few announcements. I want to thank everybody for tuning in and for being here. Just a reminder that any of you out there in cyberspace that would like to join us, you're welcome to. Um, But it's good to be together again. Thanks for giving us your prayers, your comments, your giving. We appreciate it. And I just want to share, you know, we haven't done this for a while because we usually do it in our fellowship time, but I just like to share the birthdays. Now, I'm not going to share all the ones from April and May and June. Um, you'll have to research that a little bit. There's been lots that have gone by, but I just want to share some of the birthdays from July. So Romario had a birthday, uh, Evan and Nicole Chown, and Brian had a birthday yesterday. Is that 49, is it? <laughs> and Irene Franca and Vi Harbage is coming up. Not yet, but her birthday's in July as well. My wife had a birthday this past week, and uh, my birthday is at the end of the month. Also, Miriam Torres, for those of you who know her, Megan had a, is having a birthday in a couple of days. And Taku... Uh, Chunku's son had a birthday the same day as Brian. So I thought, why don't those of us who have masks, we can sing it, and those who don't, you can follow me behind the screen. (laughs) You, You can hum. Let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Aren't you finding that there's more and more celebrations we're missing because of this time? We're just still trying to figure out how to do this well. But uh, God is good, and He's still celebrating us. So it's good. Um, Just to let you know that my wife and I are going on holidays to get a little bit of a break in the next few weeks, so Gabriel will be taking over. Pray for Gabriel. He's got a full-time job as well as serves here well. So pray for Pastor Gabriel in the next little while especially, particularly that he can get rest. (laughs) Um, Our other churches are slowly starting to join. Um, So the Korean congregation will be starting up this afternoon. Our East Indian Orthodox Church started yesterday, and the Filipinos are just starting to look at it. So Um, Be praying for other churches as they manage all these changes as well. Uh, Keep praying for, uh, for those of you who don't know, Romario and Mobeni's mom had a stroke. Um, She just, I would say, in her 50s, not very old. Um, So just please be praying for her recovery. Um, She's in a good hospital, but uh, needs God's input into her life. Let's, so let's, let's bow in prayer as we begin our service. God, I just thank you so much that you are here among us. And in all the changes and all the difficulties and in all the different things we're experiencing, you are right here if we just turn the valve on and allow your love and grace and peace and power to flow. God, we welcome your spirit here this morning. We thank you that You are here among us. God, give us eyes to see you. Give us ears to hear you. 
Give us a heart that's focused on you. And just overwhelm us with your power and your love and your presence. Comfort us. Grow us. Teach us, Lord, as we worship you this morning. We pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Aram's going to lead us in some more singing. Or humming. What's that? <laughs> or humming. Or humming. That's right. I know some of you got masks, so you can try singing. If you're home, hey, go for it. <laughs> your name the mountains shake and crumble at your name the oceans roar and tumble at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out lord of all the earth will shout your name shout your name filling up the skies with endless praise endless praise yahweh yahweh we love to shout your name your name the morning breaks in glory at your name creation sings your story at your name the 
Well, good morning, everyone. I know I can't, thank you. <laughs> I know I can't see everyone, but I know you're out there. Um, and speaking of that, I've had something on my heart all week, and it may seem a little strange, maybe a little silly, but it won't leave me, so I'm trusting it's of God. Who remembers Romper Room? Yes, okay, so Pastor Greg remembers Romper Room. Okay, yes, thank you. All right, so that was a children's show where there was kids on the program and kids at home watching. See the parallel? <laughs> and the, uh, the hostess of Romper Room, of course, had her magic mirror, which of course it wasn't magic. But at the end of the program, she would hold up her mirror and she would look through it and she would say, and I see Susie and I see George. And, uh, and she would say happy birthday to certain children as well. And it just was a way of letting those kids know that they are seen to uh, make them feel included. And uh, so in the same way, that's what I sense God wants to do this morning, is that there's those of us here, I can see all of you, but there's so many at home. There's those around the world, as Pastor Greg has said, but there's also those that are regular members of this congregation that have not been able to come for various reasons. And we just want you to know this morning that we're thinking of you, and uh, you're on our hearts, you're here with us in so many ways, and that uh, although I and we cannot see you physically, that God himself does see you. And uh, we just pray that God would uh, be ever present with you as you uh, worship with us this morning, okay? Um, I just wanna share this morning that in the fall, I took a soul care course, and it was by Dr. Uh, Rob Reimer, and through that soul care course, I continued to read a couple more of his books. And in those books, often he referred to a man named George Mueller. So it caught my curiosity. And so I ordered the book, and, uh, and just I'm halfway through it. It's a very small book. Here it is. It's called Answers to Prayer. And it is just amazing. I'm just quite taken by it. So George Muller was a pastor at the time, and he was very concerned about the amount of Christian people that were, as he said, distressed in mind, and that they were struggling with various issues in life. Um, they were having trouble with really having, really trusting in God and having faith and um, seeing God as the living God, the God that answers prayer. So in response to this concern that he had, he uh, decided, after, after much prayer actually, um, that he was going to open an orphanage. And he had already had an experience prior with someone else who did the same thing. Um, but here's the thing that caught my attention, was that this orphanage, uh, it came about by prayer only. So he, um, sorry, just was thinking about a couple other things I wanted to share. But um, the whole way that the orphanage came about was by prayer only. He did not ask any particular human being for anything. And all of these orphanages, which ended up housing um, over his lifetime, 10,000 children, um, all came about because of prayer and prayer alone. And so um, part of what he says here is he said, I long to set something before the children of God, whereby they might see that he does not forsake, even in our day, those who rely upon him. And he says, my spirit longed to be instrumental in strengthening their faith by giving them not only instances from the word of God, 
of his willingness and ability to help all those who rely upon him, but to show them by proofs that he is the same today and that God is a God of miracles. And so what he shares here is he had on his heart to look after the orphans. There was about 250,000 orphans due to disease and parents dying. Um, but he, so he had a heart to care for those children. But he says the primary objective of the work was that God might be magnified by the fact that the orphans under my care are provided with all they need only by prayer and faith without anyone being asked by me or my fellow laborers where it may be seen that God is faithful still and hears prayer still. That I was not mistaken has been abundantly proved since November 1835 both by the conversion of many sinners who have read the accounts which have been published in connection with this work and also by the abundance of fruit that has followed in the hearts of the saints. Um, so when I thought about it, the magnitude of it, all of these orphanages, thousands of children to feed, and all prayer alone, various um, accounts in here that are just mind-blowing of how God answered prayer, how he provided everything from furniture, housing, food, bread, milk. Of course, it's important to know that there were lots of struggles along the way, and we know about struggles. We're in the midst of that right now. So I found this really encouraging. Um, so in the midst of various struggles, he continued to pray and just trust in God. And I want to read you something. It took me a few times to read it to get the flow of it because we're talking kind of old English. Um, but I want to read this to you so you can get a little bit of a glimpse of the faith of this man. Um, that without question, of course, God's going to answer. Absolutely. It says, Perhaps, dear reader, you have said in your heart before you have read thus far, how would it be, suppose the funds for the orphans were reduced to nothing, and those who were engaged in the work had nothing of their own to give, and a mealtime were to come for the children, and you had no food. Well, he responds and says, Thus indeed it may be, for our hearts are desperately wicked. If ever we should be so left to ourselves as that either we depend no more upon the living God or that we regard iniquity in our hearts, then such a state of things we have reason to believe would occur. But so long as we shall be enabled to trust in the living God and so long as he adds, though falling short in every way of what we might be and ought to be, we are at least kept from living in sin. Such a state of things cannot occur. And I just love how he states that. Um, from what I understand, he wrote in his journal, there was 50,000 answers to prayer. And supposedly about 30,000 of those were answered within the first few hours, within 24 hours. Um, absolutely incredible and certainly an encouragement for me and I hope for you today. Um, so I just want to say sometimes we really can get discouraged by situations and things that are happening in our lives and I think we've all felt a bit of that the past while. But one thing that he says is, suppose you want your faith to be strengthened. You should not shrink from opportunities where your faith may be tried. Trials, obstacles, difficulties, and sometimes defeats are the very food of faith. So we're in a challenging time. Uh, some of us are at home. I'm not sure what all the various things are that we face. But certainly George Muller puts across that faith is strengthened through all the various things that we uh, come through. My daughter just told me on Friday that um, she said, Mom, through the last four months, with everything going on, she said, myself and my husband's faith has grown so much. So there's a testimony right there. And I know I've certainly changed and grown uh, in so many ways. And God is faithful. And as Pastor Greg said, God's got this. He's in control. And uh, he knows what he's doing. So we need to trust him. I'd like to read for, for you this morning from 1 Peter 1, 3 to 7. 
Praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is so good. And by raising Jesus from death, he has given us new life and a hope that lives on. God has something stored up for you in heaven where it will never decay or be ruined or disappear. You have faith in God, whose power will protect you until the last day. Then he will save you just as he has always planned to do. On that day, you will be glad, even if you have, have to go through many hard trials for a while, your faith will be like gold that has been tested in a fire. And these trials will prove that your faith is worth much more than gold that can be destroyed. They will show you that you will be given praise and honor and glory when Jesus Christ returns. Shall we pray? Lord God, thank you so much for the reality of who you are, your love and your grace, your faithfulness, O oh God, that no matter what we go through, Father, you have our best interest in mind and you see us through all things. I pray, Father God, that our faith would be strengthened and we would see you as the living God, the God who answers our prayers. May we be a people who are prayerful people for all the concerns on our hearts. And I'm excited, Lord God, to see and hear the results and the answers of prayer that you would have for us this day. So we ask for all the many concerns for each and every person here and those who are watching and worshiping with us, Lord God, the concerns of the church. Lord God, we lay them before you and we trust you to see everything through. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Why, God, do people have to die? Daughter or a son, sudden and so young, long before their time. People fall apart. Promise and a ring becomes a broken thing. Growth that got too hard. I don't understand, but I understand why. Our scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians 2, verses 11 to 22, and we'll be reading from the NIV version. Therefore, 
Remember that formerly you, who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too, are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. Thank you, Vic. For those of you who are just tuning in, we've been looking through the book of Acts and this morning we come to Acts chapter 17, and we're not going to look at the whole chapter, but I just want to come to one verse, which we'll get to in a bit. I've been watching some of the news in the last few months where we see in the middle of all this virus, this unrest starting to build uh, between different races, between authority and those not in authority, between police and others between black and white and so on. Uh, particularly in the States, it's, it seems to be very pronounced. But I, it's, it wasn't a surprise to me when I started to see some of the things in the States. Back in 1996, I went down to a clergy conference put on by Promise Keepers in Atlanta, Georgia. And there was about 40,000 clergy from all over the world that filled the Georgia Dome in Atlanta. And there were some amazing services in there. But there was one part of the services that happened in the different seminars and so on that really intrigued me. And I didn't fully understand the significance of it. What happened was there was a man named Tony Evans who is a well-known Christian author, a pastor, and uh, if, you, if you don't mind me saying this, he, he's a kind of a, a lighter colored black person. I don't know how else to disguise, describe it. But he was sitting up on the stage and another man who is a darker colored black person came up on the stage fairly spontaneously, Wellington Boone, and washed Tony Evans' feet. And I didn't get it. A lot of the Americans there seemed to understand what was going on. I didn't understand it. And so I asked one of our new friends down there who was a, a black pastor, and I said, what's going on here? And he said, well, you see, a lot of the black community saw Tony Evans as kind of a sellout to the white community. And Wellington Boone was really taking quite a courageous step to offer his forgiveness to Tony Evans and say, listen, let's put this stuff behind us. We are one. And so I began talking to this pastor, a black pastor from the southern states, and I said, I mean, really? Is this really still an issue? I mean, in the church? 
He says, oh, you better believe it. He said, in this area of the world, he says, there are actually uh, ministerials for white people, pastors and ministerials for black pastors. I was kind of shocked. And he went on, he says, it's not just that. He says, some of us black pastors can't even preach on some of the white radio stations. And I thought, wow. I thought in my Bible, the way I read it, the way I grew up, was under the assumption that in Christ, there is no male or female. There is no black or white. There is no slave or free. But Christ was supposed to be all and in all. And clearly something was going wrong. And, and people, this isn't 300 years ago in the middle of slave, the height of slavery. This is 1996, not long ago. And it boggled my brain that Bible-believing Christians had been deceived into thinking that racial discrimination or discrimination on any level was okay. So how does this even happen? I mean, are we immune to this up here in Canada? I mean, what does Christianity actually teach on the subject, and what is God's heart in all of this? And before we rush to say too quickly that, you know, here at Northmount, we're pretty good. We got people of different nationalities here um, that, you know, we're, we're doing all right. Let me remind us all that it was just a few short years ago that our church was mostly white. And that we didn't have those flags of different nations that come into this building. And we struggled a little bit bringing in different groups into this church. And I know there's people that struggle with the smells of different foods and wondering if people are going to actually integrate with us, not realizing that maybe we're part of the struggle too. And if you've come from another country and... All of us have come from another country at some point, except for our First Nations friends. We may have been treated in a certain way where we have developed underlying issues with people from one country or another. And as I look back over Alberta's history, I remember as a teenager growing up with some of the jokes about different ethnic groups. And there's been names. I mean, you can watch some of the old shows. Um, I think it was All in the Family, where they had a name for, a kind of a derogatory name for every single nationality. And I remember growing up with the, the jokes, jokes about First Nations and Pakistanis and Indians and the Italians and the Irish and the Ukrainians and the Polish and the Germans and the Vietnamese. Remember the boat people that came over? And the Chinese and the Arabs, and it goes on and on and on. And it seems that in all of us, there is this tendency to fear the unknown. And we put down the unknown. Because it doesn't matter to us because they're distant. And we create distance with people that we don't understand or that we fear or we don't know. And it really wasn't any different in Paul's day. The Middle East, you know, we kind of see this big Roman Empire and Paul goes around and shares about Jesus. But underneath all of that, boiling and roiling underneath all of that was tremendous hostility between nations. Yes, there was this Roman peace, the Pax Romana, right? They built the roads and they made peace. But it wasn't a true peace. I mean, the Jews hated the Gentiles. They especially hated these, the half-breed Samaritans. The Romans hated the Jews. There were Scythians. There were Egyptians. There was even this category called barbarians. We still use that kind of term sometimes today as a derogatory thing. But barbarians back then was pretty much anybody who didn't speak Greek. They were considered barbarians. 
And Roman citizens were given much different treatment than non-Romans and slaves. So this isn't something new that we're experiencing today. But it's something that comes out of our broken human nature that we've always fallen into. And there's something in all of our nature, all of us, that has a little bit of that nature to maybe treat some people a little bit different or generalize a certain group. I want us to turn to Acts chapter 17 where we find Paul addressing some of the prejudices head on in the city of Athens. Now we'll come back later to the book of uh, Acts and fill out the rest of the chapter Paul gives a full, long message in Athens that we may have heard before. But for now, I just want to focus in on one verse, verse 26. And to give it a little bit of context, Paul has been touring around the Roman Empire, sharing this incredibly good news about Jesus. This Jesus of Nazareth, who the Romans crucified in Jerusalem. And he comes to, he has just finished stops in Thessalonica and Berea. And if you remember, the, the Jews in Thessalonica, they did not like his message. They were very set on keeping the laws, as we read earlier in our reading in Ephesians, that Paul addresses in Ephesus about circumcised versus uncircumcised. And the Jews, the Judaizers, they said, No, 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 Paul. You cannot be saying that Jews and Gentiles, uncircumcised and circumcised, can be in the same room together well. That just doesn't work. And so they were after him. And then he comes to Berea, where he gets a little bit better response. And then he comes to Athens, where some of these people are still following him. And people are starting to hear about Paul's ideas. And a group of Jews who don't associate with Gentiles have followed him trying to stop this inclusive speech of Paul's about Jesus. And now some non-Jews of Athens who loved new ideas, and Athens was famous for having speeches about new ideas. And they said, hey Paul, you know, we hear a lot of stuff going on. We want to know what all this kerfuffle is about. Would you come to the Oropagus and speak to us? And so Paul does. And he's introduced to this unknown God. And he talks about this unknown God. And we'll get back to that in another uh, sermon. But he, in verse 26, he talks about this unknown God. And he describes him in this way. Listen while I read. He says, from one man he made every nation or every ethnos, every ethnic group. This isn't nations with boundaries, right? It's ethnic groups, tribes, and so on. He says, From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. Now there's a lot to unpack in that. And as an aside, remember... If God, if it is God who is determining where people should live, and when we live in a time where millions of people around the world are on the move, we are getting refugees and immigrants and emigrants all over this world. In fact, you can look on YouTube as time-lapsed pictures of watching the train of people leaving Middle East and leaving different places and going other places. It's incredible, the movement that's happening today. But when you see that, our first thought should not be, they should go back home. (laughs) Or we should have too. (laughs) Our thought should be, what is God up to? And what is His purpose in all of this? Now let's get back to the verse. If we're ever going to get to a place where we actually go deeper than the color of somebody's skin or the country where they started from, if we're actually going to see the difference or see no difference in who we are as a larger people, 
then there are several foundational passages that we find in Scripture and the several foundational principles that are in the Scriptures that we need to learn. And particularly in this one passage that talks about the oneness of humanity. So when we look at the Scriptures, let's notice some of these foundations. The first thing that I see in this verse and elsewhere is that Paul is pointing out that God made all ethnic groups from one human ancestor. Notice a couple of things. First, God is the maker of ethnic groups. God made from one every nation. In other words, ethnic groups do not come about by some random genetic change over billions of years, regardless what you think about all of that, God is in control of all this. And so we cannot look at all the changes and say, well, some are more faulty than others, because all of peoples of this earth come about by God's design and His purpose. And the text this morning says plainly, God made every ethnos, every ethnic group. So when you look out at people, you need to firmly keep in your mind that that person that you see is made by God specifically that way. Think about it. Now, this was an especially a big wallop for the people of Athens. Because Athens saw themselves as a very special people. In fact, the Athenians, they prided themselves on the fact that they did not immigrate from somewhere else. They had always been in this spot. They were true people. They called themselves Arachthones, which means that they sprang from the native soil. And we're not immigrants from some other place or group. And people, Paul chooses to confront this head on by saying that God made all the ethnic groups from one. To the Athenians, what they're hearing is, Paul is saying Athenians and barbarians come from the same place, from the cut from the same cloth. These are the people that the Athenians despised. And Paul says, hold on a second, guys. You all come from the same place, from one God. The second thing I see Paul saying is that all members of every ethnic group are made in the image of God. Remember Genesis chapter 1, verse 27? God created man, that's man and woman, all of us, man in general, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And when you put this teaching of Genesis chapter 1, that God created the first man in his image, together with the teaching of Acts 17, that all spring from this one, that God made all ethnic groups from this one first ancestor, what emerges is that all members of all ethnic groups are made in the image of God. So no matter what the skin color, no matter what the facial features or the texture of their hair or whatever genetic traits you can pick up, every human being in every ethnic group has an immortal soul has a being, every part of us is created in God's image. When you look around, when I look around, every person in this room is created in God's image. A, mi a mind with unique God-like -like reasoning powers, a heart with cap capacities for moral judgments, and spiritual affections, and this potential relationship renewed with God that sets every person apart utterly from animals which God had made. Every being, 
no matter what color, what shape, what age, what gender, what intelligence, what health or social caste, is made in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. Amen? And get this. And the person that you choose to despise is also made in the image of God. Are you happy about that? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> and then thirdly, in determining the significance of who you are, being a person image in the, made in the image of God, if you are to compare the ethnic distinctives the way the noonday sun compares to a candle, there's no comparison. In other words, finding your main identity in whiteness or blackness or any other color, you're missing the point. That's just one little layer of who we are. When we're teaching our kids, and if we're giving them a hundred eggs in a basket that explain who people are, out of those hundred eggs, maybe one can have to do with ethnicity. But 99 of them should be talking about this God-like humanity, this God-like image that we all possess, the heart of man that God loves. I think this is why so much of the diversity training doesn't work very well. Because so often it focuses on the differences rather than the common image of God that is there. Fourthly, and this one is a tougher one for us, particularly in North America and Europe, the prediction of a curse that Noah spoke over some of the descendants of Ham in Genesis chapter 9 is absolutely irrelevant in deciding how the black race is to be viewed and treated. See, it used to be, I have a book downstairs that shows some of the writings from a couple hundred years ago that used this passage in the Old Testament to prove that it was okay for blacks to be slaves. It is so deadly wrong. And over the centuries, this has been in people's thinking and in their conscience. But let's actually look at this passage to see what actually happened so we can clear this up once and for all. If you'll recall, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In Genesis chapter 9, we have the story where one of his sons looked on his naked body when he was drunk. It says, verse 21, And Noah drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon their shoulders, and walked backwards to cover the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah woke from his wine... He knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be, and listen carefully, or will be, cursed be, Canaan, a servant of ser servants, he shall be to his brothers. Notice several things about this curse. First of all, Noah's curse is not on him, it's on Canaan. Now, Noah takes the occasion of his, the sin of his son Ham and uses it to make a pr prediction about the posterity of Ham's youngest son, Canaan. Basically, the prediction is that the Canaanites will eventually be overpowered by the descendants of Shem and Japheth. Now, there's lots of questions we could ask around this, but I just want to point out a few things relevant to what we're talking about today. So Ham had four sons according to Genesis chapter 10. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. Now, broadly speaking, Cush is probably the ancestors of the people of Ethiopia, Mizraim, the ancestors of the Egyptians, Put, the ancestors of the people of Northern Africa, the Libyans. But Canaan is the one of the sons of the four who is not 
an ancestor of the African people. Genesis chapter 10 names the descendants of Canaan. Basically, the father is Sidon, Heth, the Jebusites, Amorites, Gergesites. Basically, the Canaanites. In other words, where Israel is today. These people were the inhabitants of Canaan, not Africa at all. So they messed up in their interpretation. And the prediction of Noah came true that the Canaanite nations were driven out by Israel later on. We read that in Deuteronomy 9 and so on. So the curse does not fall on the African people, but on Canaanites. Second, the predicted curse of Noah does not dictate how God's people should treat individual Canaanites. For example, if, if you look five chapters later from where they're driven out, uh, or, or Canaan's um, sons and so on, where we find out where they were from, five chapters later, we meet Melchizedek. He's a Canaanite. He comes from Jerusalem, actually, who was a righteous man, and it says he was the priest of the Most High God, who blessed Abraham. Abraham gives him a tenth of his spoils. And not, so not even the fact that God ordains to bring judgment on evil nations dictates for us how we are to treat individuals from those nations. Does that make sense? And the thirdly, in Genesis chapter 12, God sets in this great motion of this plan of redemption for all the nations to rescue them from this and every other curse of sin and judgment. And he calls Abram from all the nations from a, and makes a covenant with him and says, I'm going to bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. And fourthly, all those families of the earth includes the Canaanite family. So there's no way you can separate out any ethnic group as somebody that should be slaves forever. It just makes no sense at all. So what we see is that what Abra with Abraham, what God is setting into motion, this plan of redemption, overturns every other curse for everyone who received the blessing of Abraham. Namely, this forgiveness and acceptance of God that eventually comes through Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, which leads us to the fifth point. It's God's purpose and command that we make disciples for Jesus from every ethnic group in the world without distinction. Remember Matthew 28, his famous command? All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, of every ethnic group, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you always. Make disciples of all nations, every ethnic group. It's the same phrase that's used in Acts chapter 17, verse 26, where it says that he made one from every nation. And now he's making a new one from every nation. And so just as all ethnic groups are created in the image of God, so God aims to redeem people from every ethnic group. And so being in God's image doesn't mean we are saved. We're all distorted by sin. The unique way that we're created to reflect the glory and worth of God, a lot of that has been broken. So God sends His Son, Jesus, into the world to die for us so that we believe on Him, we're forgiven, cleansed, and restored, and become this new one world. Sixthly, all believers in Jesus Christ of every ethnic group are united to each other, not only in this common humanity that comes out of Adam in the image of God, but even more, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Hasn't it been amazing in the last few years? I mean, I love the fact that Gabriel is my brother. I love the fact that Chunku is my brother. I love the fact that Nixon's my brother. 
and Haram is my sister, and everybody here is my brothers and sisters. It's a phenomenal thing we have in Jesus. Amen? So beyond this oneness of image of God in humanity, we are actually members of the same body. Romans 12 says, Just as we have many members but one body, all the members do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of another. So just to paraphrase this passage a little bit, the body of Christ has a black hand and a white wrist and a yellow arm and a red shoulder. And the white wrist cannot say to the black hand, I have no need of you. Think about that. The white wrist cannot say to the black hand, I have no need of you. And the Chinese arm cannot say to the First Nations shoulder, because I am not a shoulder, I have no part of the body. And then we have that further image, not only of a body, but of a family. In 1 John 3, see how great a love of the Father is bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God, and such we are. Can you imagine children up in heaven, of God's children, sitting on Jesus' lap and saying, Jesus, how come he gets to sit on your lap? He's different. And Jesus says, um, you're both different. <laughs> in fact, everybody here is different. What's your point? We're all part of the same family. Don't you get it? Like, get with the program, right? In other words, if our identity as human beings created in the image of God is greater than our ethnic distinctives, then our identity as reborn children of God is even greater than our ethnic, all of the ethnic differences. It's a great truth that we are more unified by our humanity than separated by our ethnicity. Think about that. And on top of this common human personhood in the image of God, we have this redeemed personhood in the image of Christ. And how much less are we divided by ethnic differences? Colossians 3 says this, as Paul is still trying to drive this home among the Christians who are still squabbling, he says, there is not Greek and Jew and circumcised and uncircumcised and barbarian and Scythian and slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. Every time we catch ourselves thinking a slur or a negative thought or trying to tolerate somebody by staying away, we're forgetting that that same Christ in you is actually in them and maybe more in them at that moment. Seventh, the Bible forbids intermarriage between believer and non-believer, but not between members of different ethnic groups. 1 Corinthians 7 says, A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she's freed to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. In other words, stay together on the same page spiritually when you're contemplating marriage. All you young people out there, think about this. Keep God first in your life when you're making those lifelong partner decisions. We're free to marry, but we need to share the allegiance to Jesus. Look for his image. Look for Christ in others. The issue is never about mixing color. Get that one right out of our heads. And then finally, this great ground of our identity, it's not our ethnic differences, but our common humanity, the image of God, and our new humanity, the image of Christ. So we need to rise up against this spirit of indifference and alienation and hostility in the States and Canada, around this world. And we need to start looking for and embracing and prioritizing the supremacy of God's love 
to take new steps personally and corporately as a church and as a nation toward racial reconciliation so that it is visibly expressed in ourselves, in our community, in our church. So what does that mean? What do we actually have to do to get there? Well, I think we need to start by eliminating every little belittling and unloving thought from our minds. We also need to put aside every word or tone of ridicule or disdain out of our mouths. We need to go out of our way, and here's the tougher part. It's easy to stop some of those things and just be quiet. But we need to go out of our way to show personal, affectionate oneness with Christ of all ethnic backgrounds instead of a convenient tolerance and avoidance. See, you know, we have a Filipino church among us. Have you ever met them? We have a Korean church. Do you have friends among them? We have an East Indian Orthodox church. How do you know them? Who do you know in your neighborhood that is a different race? Do you make an effort to cross those barriers, to get to know them, even be a friend to them? We need to go out of our way. We need to be the salt and the light in this hostile and fearful society, this polarized society, with courageous acts of interracial kindness and respect. And in short, we need to look to Christ to find the strength to do this. We can't do this on our own. We need Jesus to be forgiven, to be cleansed, to be healed, to be empowered, to love as we let His unending, all-inclusive love set us free and wash over us. Amen. Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for the constant challenges you give us from your word. God, forgive us for the many times we sit so smugly in our houses and in our walk thinking, I don't hate anybody. And yet we avoid certain people. We tolerate certain people. And we just don't like them as much as others. God, break our hearts with your compassion. Fill us with the strength of your spirit that allows us to love beyond our humanness and our brokenness. Give us the courage to walk with Jesus to the prostitute, to the Samaritan, to the people from all over this world and make disciples in Jesus' name and love on them in tangible ways in Jesus' name. We pray in his authority, in his power. Amen. Haram's going to help us close with a song called Build Your Kingdom Here. And as she plays, allow the Holy Spirit to challenge your heart. Let the Holy Spirit speak into your heart the name of that one prayer or the face of that one person that you struggle with. Because we all don't treat everybody the same. And let God minister to you while she sings and worship him. All right, so this is a foot stomper. <laughs> Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wild.
There's a reason that people are coming from all over the world and moving all over the world because God is building his church. And guess what? When we get to heaven, there's going to be people, people from all over the world. So we may as well get used to it now. Like I tell our other congregations, we need to get together more often so we can practice for heaven. Amen? God is good, and he's been here among us today, and he has lots to teach us. Now may the love of God be the passion in your heart. May the joy of God, your strength, when times are hard. And the presence of God, a peace that overflows. And the word of God, the seed that you might sow. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning.